This is your USMNT Abroad Weekend update from January 19th to January 21st of 2024. Hi, and you're here on Filippo, and welcome to Tactical Manager TV, and welcome to the US Men's National Team Abroad Series, a channel favorite where every single Monday we update you on how the Yanks did abroad over the weekend. And if you made it to this Monday... Congratulations, because it means you have survived Burhalter Ball's agonizing, inhuman soccer terrorism over the weekend, either by pushing through it, you know, push through the pain like myself, or just by not watching it, which is probably what we should have all done. I have good news, though. Nico Joachini is again an American abroad, and he will be re-added to the series. He heads to Como in the second division of Italy and they're fighting for promotion. So sure, he's not heading to a great league, the Italian second division, but he could be in the Serie A next season. And I appreciate the fact that he did not get comfortable and stay in MLS and he's going to go out to Europe and fight for a spot in the Italian first division. I appreciate that. That's the right mentality. And obviously, we'll be covering him here at the channel from time to time because we don't cover the Italian second division every single weekend, but I'll most certainly be rooting for him to be successful. With that said, this video is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, but more on that later. Shall we begin? As always, we start with the top five leagues in Europe, the first one being the English Premier League. So let's talk about Matt Turner that plays for Nottingham Forest. On Saturday, Matt Turner started and played the full 90 minutes for Nottingham Forest during their 3-2 loss to Brentford. For this match, the first goal was on Matt Turner. In my very humble opinion, Ivan Toney was able to curl the ball right by the side of the wall to score off a free kick. A very easy shot, mainly due to how bad the wall was positioned, how bad it was built. Let's just say this is a wall that Donald Trump would absolutely not be proud of. And sure, Ivan Tony did move the ball a bit to the side before taking the free kick, and the ref probably should have told him to place it back, but Turner should have also adjusted the wall, and the wall seemed out of position to begin with. If you rewatch the, the play in general, Tony moves the ball once, then Turner runs to the post, checks the wall, and pretty much says it's fine. Then Ivan Tony moves it a tiny bit more, and Turner still didn't go to fix it. Essentially, Ivan Tony showed us what we call in Brazil that he has malandragem, and Matt Turner doesn't have that. That's honestly something that you just learn from playing soccer in the streets from a very young age. And most players in Europe and South America have that. In the U.S., not so much. And Ivan Tony clearly has a lot of malandragem, and he he definitely enjoys cheating and 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 well you guys know where i'm going with this the other two goals were absolutely not matt turner's fault there's nothing he could have done but the problem is turner is actually not having a good season the eye test tells us he's not playing well and so do the stats the reason i say this is because if we use onana from manchester united as an example he looks poor if you watch manchester united but when you look into the advanced analytics he's actually fine he has conceded a lot of goals, but it seems like it's more of a Manchester United problem. Onana ranks among the top goalkeepers when it comes to saves, save percentage, goals prevented, clean sheets. He also has zero errors that led to goals. While Matt Turner, you could say that Nottingham Forest is the problem, which is true. They are the problem but so is Matt Turner. In terms of saves and save percentage, Matt Turner is average when compared to other goalkeepers in the English Premier League, so that's fine. But his goals prevented is a negative 4.54, which is the second worst in the league. And that also means a lot of his saves were probably easy saves, or a lot of the goals he conceded were very savable. He's also the goalkeeper with the highest amount of errors that led to goals for a total of three, even though he didn't play five matches because he was benched. My point is, statistically, he ain't doing great. And when you actually watch him, it also seems like he ain't doing great. I think it's a mix of his confidence being low and maybe just struggling to adapt to a high load of minutes at the highest level possible. And I still believe he can bounce back. I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I'm just reporting on what's happening right now. And hopefully he does bounce back sooner rather than later. Because Matt Turner is still our number one goalkeeper until someone else rises. And at the time of this recording, no one has. 
Next up, we have Chris Richards from Crystal Palace. On Saturday, Chris Richards started and played the full 90 minutes for Crystal Palace during their 5-0 loss to Arsenal. Usually, when you are a defender and your defense concedes five goals, there are high odds that you didn't play well. And you guys and girls, whoever watches this video, probably see where I'm going with this. Richards didn't play well. For the first goal that Arsenal scored, it was all on Richards. His poor defending on set pieces was the issue and it allowed Gabriel Magalhães to dunk on him and score off a header after a corner. The second goal was also scored by Gabriel Magalhães with a header off a corner. And this time he didn't dunk on Chris Richards. Chris Richards actually just lost him in the box. So two really bad moments from Richards defending set pieces that led to Arsenal having a 2-0 lead. They ended up losing by five and he only had blame on two of those five goals. Still not a good performance by Richards. It happens. By the way, he actually played as a center back this match while previously he was mainly playing as a central defensive midfielder. He's still a center back in my opinion and honestly a great one. Performances like this happen, especially against great teams like Arsenal. What really matters is how fast you bounce back. That's what matters. And hopefully Chris Richards bounces back sooner rather than later. Now we have Austin Trusty from Sheffield United. On Sunday, Trusty started and played 80 minutes for Sheffield United during their 2-2 draw with West Ham. Last but not least in England, we have the Fulham boys, A-Rob and Tim Ream. And Fulham didn't play this weekend, but they do have an EFL Cup semi-final second leg match on Wednesday against Liverpool. Liverpool won the first leg 2-1, but Fulham plays the second match at home. And look, Liverpool are the clear favorites here, but Fulham has a shot and hopefully they advance. Now that we're done with England, let's go to Italy and talk about the Americans that play in the Serie A. And the first one will be Christian Pulisic from Milan. And I guess the first two will be Christian Pulisic and Yunus Musa from Milan. On Saturday, Pulisic started and played 75 minutes for Milan during their 3-2 win over Udinese. Yunus Musa came off the bench in added time to help them hold a 3-2 lead. You hear that, Jesse Marsh? It's Yunus Musa, not Yusuf. Musa. So I watched this match while also watching that monstrosity of a game between the US men's national team and Slovenia for Camp Cupcake. When I used to struggle to sleep at night, I would take a melatonin pill and boom, it would do the trick. But those cost money. Now what I do is I record Burhalter ball matches and I rewatch them around 10 or 11 p.m. and Honestly, Burhalter has cured Insonia in this country. He may not be a good coach, but we must appreciate him for what he's good at. And this dude is a walking piece of melatonin with no charisma. And we should appreciate that. Sort of, kind of, not, not really. We shouldn't appreciate crap of what he does. It's mostly but back to the Milan game. I thought Pulisic looked good. He was making the right decisions, looking dangerous, drawing fouls. He was able to create space and get a nice cross to Giroud, but unfortunately the goalkeeper saved the header. I thought Pulisic was good and just got unlucky to not get a goal or an assist for this specific match. Milan did, however, get a comeback without Pulisic. I want to also add that as context right here, even though that doesn't really change his performance and how I evaluate it because I thought he was really good. I don't have much to say about Yunus Musa's performance. He was subbed in with like two minutes left to help hold the 3-2 lead. What I will say is that his minutes have gone down ever since he returned from injury. For the past three matches in the Serie A, he played roughly 30 minutes, which is kind of low considering he was starting plenty of matches earlier in the season. We shall see if it will remain that way. I'm not really worried because this is his first season in Italy. I think he's still adjusting and he's honestly getting already more minutes than I expected. Still in Italy, we have Weston McKenney and Tim Weah from Juventus. On Sunday, McKennie started and played the full 90 minutes for Juve during their 3-0 win over Lecce in the Serie A. Tim Weah started off the bench and was subbed in around minute 57 when the match was still 0-0. Weah was fine, but let's talk about Weston McKennie because he was fantastic once again. And for this match, it sort of felt like Weston McKennie deserved a goal, even though he didn't get one. And it also felt like he got a goal, even though he didn't get one. McKinney almost scored off a header earlier in the game, but the defender was able to clear it off the line. And then McKinney did end up getting an assist. And this assist was actually quite frustrating. McKinney headed the ball off a cross and it seemed like it was going in. And I think it might have gone in. But out of nowhere, Vlahovic came in and pushed it to the back of the net, essentially taking the goal away from Weston McKinney and awarding him with an assist. And an assist isn't bad. The same way food is food and food is not bad. But imagine you had a Chipotle burrito and I took that burrito from you and I just handed you Taco Bell. I mean, 
it's still food, but Taco Bell kind of sucks. And the Chipotle burrito is pretty damn good. So you get the point I'm trying to make. But that's not all for Wesley McKinney. He was also good in plenty of other aspects of the game. Combination play, covering ground, set pieces, defending, while also looking very goal dangerous. Wesley McKinney's form and consistency for Juventus this season has been actually quite remarkable. It's honestly one of the best seasons I have ever seen from any U.S. men's national team abroad in a top five league. And I'm not exaggerating. It's probably easy a top five best season among USMNT players in top five leagues in Europe in history or actually top five leagues in the world because the top five leagues in Europe are the top five best leagues in the world now before we continue and go to Germany make sure to hit the like button because I forgot to ask you earlier in the video you can do that right now it's free and free is good unless it's free Taco Bell then it, that's not that good but it, it's still good a quick word from our sponsor underdog fantasy and thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring Tactical Manager TV. Underdog Fantasy is a fun game to play prior to any soccer match, or basketball, or football as well. But we don't talk about those two in Tactical Manager TV. Sometimes basketball during live watch-alongs. I have been playing Underdog Fantasy for over a year now. You can download the app by using the link on the description of this video, and you can also use the promo code TMTV. And Underdog will be matching your first deposit for up to $100. And in the process, you'll be helping the channel avoid bankruptcy. The game I mainly play is called Pick'em. You just click on it, scroll to the soccer section, and pick a player for a specific match and select the stats that you believe will be lower or higher. It's very easy to play, but be smart about your picks because it's not easy to win. I'll be playing some underdog fantasy during some match live streams or match live watch-alongs, so stay tuned for that as I will be forced to cheer for a player or root against him. Now, I am a professional hater, so I'll probably be rooting for the player's downfall. Once again, don't forget to use the promo code TMTV and use the link on the description of this video. Thank you, Underdog Fantasy, for sponsoring the channel. Okay, we're back. Now we're off to the Bundesliga, and why don't we start talking about Gio Reyna from Borussia Dortmund. On Saturday, Gio Reyna started off the bench and was subbed in the 74th minute for Dortmund during their 4-0 win over Cologne. Gio was sent in when Dortmund already had a 3-0 lead. He looked good on the ball as always, and he even contributed by getting a hockey assist for their fourth goal. He held the ball for just the right amount of time, then he put a nice through ball to Bayern Gittens to get an open cross to find Mukoku that would go on to score for Dortmund their fourth goal in the match. What I don't get is Dortmund was up 3-0 and Terzic sent Marco Royce a few minutes prior to Gio Reyna. Why not just send the young players in right away? The game was pretty much settled at that point. Let the old man rest, Marco Royce is like 50 years old at this point, and let the young guys get minutes, gain confidence, experience, and develop. I can't stand Terzic. I, I seriously can, and I, I'm literally counting the seconds for Gio Reyna to leave. The next player would have been Brendan Aronson, but Union Berlin's match got cancelled over the weekend due to severe weather. So after Brendan Aronson, we have John Brooks from Hoffenheim. And on Saturday, John Brooks stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Hoffenheim during their 3-2 loss to Freiburg. Now we have Joe Scali and Pifak from Borussia Mönchengladbach. On Sunday, Scali and Pifak both started for Gladbach during their 2-1 loss to Augsburg. And both of these players played the full 90 minutes and Pifak actually scored for Gladbach during this loss. What's really weird is not many people are talking about Pifak and he has actually been fairly productive in the Bundesliga this season with four goals and two assists in 12 matches played. And most of these matches, or at least half of them, he came off the bench. So those are actually pretty damn good numbers. But no one really seems to care. Next up, we have Kevin Paredes and Leonard Maloney. Kevin Paredes from Wolfsburg and Leonard Maloney from Heidenheim because they clashed over the weekend. And on Saturday, Paredes was back from injury and he started off the bench for Wolfsburg and was subbed in the 62nd minute for them during their 1-1 draw with Heidenheim. And Leonard Maloney started for Heidenheim and was subbed out around minute 72. Last but not least in Germany, we have Paxton Aronson from Eintracht Frankfurt. And on Saturday, Paxton stayed on the bench the full 90 minutes for Eintracht once again. You see, I liked the move to Eintracht when it happened, but he probably needs a loan at this point to develop. He's been there for pretty much 12 months at this point, or more than 12 months, and we have seen no progress. His minutes are not going up. If anything, they're even going down. And at this age, he turns 21 this year. He needs to play. So just like Gio, I think Paxton Aronson also needs a loan. 
Now let's leave Germany and go to Spain because now we have two Americans to report in Spain. The first one being Luca de la Torre from Celta de Vigo. And on Saturday, Luca de la Torre started and played 76 minutes for Celta de Vigo during their 1-0 loss to Real Sociedad in La Liga. I asked a friend of the channel how did Luca do because I was not able to watch this match. And he implied that Luca de la Torre was just average and that Celta de Vigo just ain't great. He also added that Luca de la Torre started this match as a left midfielder in the first half and then he was moved to a central midfield position in the second half. I don't normally cover midweek games on the weekend recap, which is this episode, but I want to give Luca de la Torre a shout out for his back heel goal during the midweek. I think I have to do that. He also got a goal and an assist in that match during their match for the Copa del Rey last Wednesday. Still in Spain, we have Johnny Cardoso from Real Betis, and he finally played. On Sunday, Johnny Cardoso made his debut for Real Betis by starting and playing 73 minutes for them during their 4-2 loss to Barcelona. And to be fair, when he was subbed out, the match was still 2-2. And this was actually a really good debut in La Liga against Barcelona. He was very good defensively, safe on the ball. He was a bit too safe on the ball at times, in my opinion. But it seemed like he was getting a bit more comfortable in the second half. And then he started to loosen up and take a bit more risks. Considering the fact that this was his first match in La Liga and it was against Barcelona, I would say looking solid is extremely encouraging. He looked like he had been there for quite some time. It didn't look like it was his La Liga debut. So during Barcelona's first goal, Johnny actually got a bit unlucky with a deflection, but the goal was not on him by any means. Outside of that, there were no noticeable mistakes from his end, and he was mainly doing the dirty work in a double pivot midfield with Marc Roca. Um, you know what? Johnny having to do the dirty work and carry a double pivot midfield with Mark Roca next to him sort of reminds me of the Leeds days when, you know, Tyler Adams had to carry the midfield for Mark Roca to do absolutely nothing. I will also add that Real Betis fans applauded Johnny Cardoso when he was subbed out of the field. Johnny has arrived. We're almost done with the top five leagues. Now we have Folleting Balogun that plays in France for Monaco. And on Saturday, Balogun started and played the full 90 minutes for Monaco during their 3-1 win over Rodez in the French Cup. I didn't watch Balogun this weekend mainly because it was the French Cup, so I can't comment on his performance. He did, however, draw a penalty kick that was converted by Ben Yedder early in the game. And according to Footmob, Balogun was the second worst performer for Monaco. But then again, as I always say, footmob ratings aren't always a good reflection of a player's performance. They're not always inaccurate, but they're also not always accurate. So take it with a grain of salt. And if you watched Balogun play this weekend, drop a comment down below. How did he do? We are done with the top five leagues. Now we're going to go to the Eredivisie, to the Netherlands, to talk about the Americans that play there. And we're going to talk about all of them in the same section. Because PSV and Utrecht clashed over the weekend, which means Dest, Tillman, and Pepe faced Taylor Booth. On Sunday, both Dest and Tillman started and played the full 90 minutes for PSV during their 1-1 draw with Utrecht. This draw ended the perfect streak they had in the Eredivisie. PSV had won the first 17 matches of their league season. Now they have 17 wins and one draw. And... I know it kind of sucks because I wish they just kept winning and they won every single match of the season if that was even possible, but the title race, it's still PSV's league to lose and they're not going to lose. They're going to win the Eta Divisie this season. As for Ricardo Pepe, he came off the bench around minute 85 for PSV and Taylor Booth started for Utrecht and played 67 minutes for them. For PSV's goal, Serginho Des got the assist by providing a nice cross off the left flank. Now for Utrecht's goal, PSV was building out of the back and Taylor Booth was able to dispossess Serginho Dest while pressing him, which led to the cross that Utrecht got into the box to tie the game. Tillman's defensive work is something I want to shout out for this game because it was actually quite impressive and encouraging since that has always been one of the things that he is not very good at, but he showed that he can defend, which is something that is always encouraging to see because you know what the player is good at and what he's good at, he's going to continue to be good at, which Tillman is really good on the ball, very technical, can create, can score, but defensively and off the ball, he's usually kind of lazy and in this game it didn't seem that way which means he is developing he's getting better or maybe he just put in more effort who knows now let's go to england and talk about the americans that play in the second division of england the first one being josh Sargent from norwich and daryl dk from west brom because norwich and west brom clashed 
over the weekend. On Saturday, Sargent started and played 64 minutes for Norwich during their 2-0 win over West Brom. Sargent scored Norwich's first goal in this match with a nice run closed by a close-range right-footed finish, while Daryl DK started off the bench and came on for West Brom around minute 69. Nice. nice. Now, the other American that we were going to cover in the EFL Championship, the second division of England, would have been Haji Wright from Coventry, but he's still injured and he's only expected to return halfway through February. So we'll keep you all posted on that. Still in the UK, we were going to report on Cameron Carter Vickers from Celtic, but he didn't play over the weekend because they played in the Scottish Cup. So they rested CCV, Cameron Carter Vickers. They still got a 5-0 win because they were probably playing a team that was like semi-pro. So Celtic advanced in the Scottish Cup without Carter Vickers playing. We're not going to report on the Italian second division this weekend. I'll probably do it next weekend when Nico Gioacchini debuts. But again, congratulations for Gianluca Busio for getting another goal in the Italian second division as Venezia might actually get promoted. I, I think they will get promoted. Now let's quickly go through the Americans that play abroad in Mexico in Liga and Mekis. The first one being Alejandro Zendejas from Club America. And on Saturday, Zendejas started and played 89 minutes for Club America during their 2-0 win over Querétaro in Liga and Mekis. And unfortunately, Chivas, Guadalajara and Monterrey played way too late on Sunday for our recording time. It was past my bedtime. So if Cade Cow made his debut for Chivas because he was sitting on the bench when the game started or Brendan Vasquez made his debut for Monterey, let us know in the comment section of this video how they did so that the other viewers can be updated. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for watching. Don't forget to drop a like before you go and check out Underdog Fantasy. The link is on the description. Thank you very much for watching and have a great day.